So I recognize a few people, my former students here. Where are you? Where are you? Anybody else I've taught here before? Yeah, up there, up there. My goodness, wow. So you're going to see some of the same stuff, so don't get bored. Right? I'll tell you some of the, some of the things. Because uh, a lot of principles of what I'm going to talk about are identical, right? They don't change. But as I say, I've been in business for 30 years. When, sometimes when I think about that, it just blows me away. And when I say I'm in business, I'm actually in business. I run a business, and I've been in a business or a partner or running my own business for 30 years. Teaching came to me by happenstance. I was asked to teach uh, at one point in what's called the MBET program, which is the Masters in Business Entrepreneurship Technology. You're familiar with that program? It's a great kind of very focused one-year uh, MBA level program, but with a huge entrepreneurial angle. And I ended up doing a lot of the, the marketing and sales components in that program. Out of that, I was asked to teach in the undergraduate program at the Department of Economics in consumer marketing. So it, was, it wasn't a destination for me, but it just became a, kind of a really cool thing to do. Um, I don't mind talking about marketing. I, I think it's, a, it's an underpinning uh, uh, amazing career for people who want to consider it. And I'm going to try to show you as much as I can. So I'm going to try to condense 30 years into about 30 minutes, if that's at all possible. Um, marketing uh, is something which can be really boring. You know, you, can, you could read a, a definition like this. You know, it's a set of business practices designed to plan for and present an organization's products or services and ways to build effective customer relationships. That may sound boring, but that's exactly what it is. And for the average person who has not been involved in that, they might think that's kind of, uh, you know, kind of an ethereal out there thing, that that's for, for other people. It's not. It's for everybody. And if, any, and if anyone in here is considering starting their own business in the future, this is going to be a core underpinning of why you're going to be successful. It is so much about marketing. So what we have to understand is what marketing does. And then, you'll see that you'll, then you'll start to understand the power, uh, power of marketing. Marketing is a really cool thing because marketing is very influential and it, and it deals with this thing called predisposition. So I want to give you that core definition of that. It's, it's the condition of being predisposed or inclined beforehand to do something to a particular opinion or course of action. So marketing is very, very influential. And when you put marketing into a business context, it's all about brands, right? Brands are incredibly powerful things. But at one point in time, all these companies meant nothing. And it wasn't until marketing made them into something that they become very relevant to you. And I'll give you uh, an example of how powerful marketing and brands are in your life. How many of you, if you went into the drugstore right now to buy toothpaste, would know exactly which toothpaste you're going to buy? I, I do. I actually walk in there. I don't even see the other ones. They're there, but I don't see them. And why don't I see them? Why don't I see them? Yeah? Because you have predisposition to what you like. I'm totally, I'm totally predisposed, exactly. And that was marketing. That made that happen, but that wasn't accidental. Those companies who have products who are really good set out to get it into my head that their brand was better than the others. And when you have a powerful brand, it eliminates competition. So companies are always looking for great marketing people who can help them make their brand the, the only one, the one and only, the one that's the predisposition is, is so powerful that we don't see the others. So it's, it's really cool, and we can never underestimate the power of brands, right? This is the thing that, that's, that's great about marketing. And I'm also a mentor here at the Accelerator Center, if you're familiar with that. We have a lot of startup companies there, and all these companies start from zero. No recognition, no branding, nobody knows who they are, and they're trying to make inroads, particularly in markets that may be already dominated by branded players. And I tell them, don't worry about it. Just be a good marketer. Because at the end of the day, and, and this is not to be mean to any particular product, but there's, the best product doesn't always win. See, I happen to think that this device here is the best product. I think BlackBerry is the best product, not just because I'm from Waterloo. I think it's the best product. But unfortunately, they got out-marketed by some other people. They got out-marketed. That was it, right? So when you look at you know, a business model, you say, if marketing is the power, we've got to make sure we understand what marketing is about so that when we, we, we tell stories to people, that they're interesting to them. First and foremost, I want to understand what you understand about marketing. Has anyone ever here actually been in a marketing role? Kind of job, part-time, summer, you know, doing some research? Even sales jobs are related to marketing. Yeah. So what, what is the exam? What have you done? Um, I was a marketing and recruitment officer for this Fox Science. 
For who? Faculty of Science at oh, Faculty of Science, okay, yeah, yeah, for school. Who else did a marketing job here? Yeah? Running events for a bar. For a, a bar? Yeah. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> no, I can see that being a lot of fun. Um, I was the marketing intern at J. Walter Thompson. Yeah, oh, it'd be, yeah. Big company, yeah. Um, product development and distribution, and then conference development as well. Oh, cool, yeah. Just every day when you're marketing yourself or in, in, <laughs> in real life, yeah, exactly, yeah. We don't get paid for that, but it, it is required. So a lot of you already have marketing experience, and it's funny you make that analogy because we are typically constantly marketing ourselves. We constantly try to get our own way. You know, when you're, when you're talking to someone else and you're trying to influence them, you're constantly marketing to them. If you want to go to a particular restaurant, they want to go to another one, and you end up winning, you're a good marketer, right? So sometimes we, we even underestimate the power of how good we are. Matter of fact, the best marketing is often done with our parents. Right? Our parents and our guardians are people who are constantly listening to our pitches. And we win a lot. I'm, I'm, I have two teenage daughters. They just wear me down. It's different. <laughs> like, I just, I cave a lot. But, I, but they're good. They got, they, got, they got good at marketing. So I've, I, you know, I've learned some of their pitches aren't always the best. But I sometimes I say, it's okay, you, I, you're a good brand to me. So. Let me tell you about marketing, because it wasn't always important. Uh, marketing is only a very recent phenomenon. There used to be a time when we had what's called the production era. You guys remember this stuff, right? Back in the kind of the turn of the century, there wasn't that much competition, so marketing wasn't important. When there's, when there's very little competition, why is marketing not very important? No what's that? You don't have a choice. No choice. Right? So in the production area, they made things. People didn't have a lot of choice. If you wanted that thing, you got it. Henry Ford was very famous he, he, for one of his quotes. Anyone know what that quote was? Yeah. You can have any color you want as long as it's black. That's not marketing. <laughs> that's basically telling you, you want a car, you want, we're making black cars, that's it, period. So that's not marketing. So the production area eventually had to give way to the sales era. Because as more competition entered the economy, people had to start going, wow, you know, people are not not just choosing us anymore. We have to start selling. This is when sales actually got a bad name in the sales era. Because now they got guys like this trying to pressure you to buy stuff. And people don't like being pressured. Don't. How many of you like being pressured to buy something? Yeah, nobody. So in the sales era, the evolution of the economy was people started to have choice. There wasn't a lot of marketing, there wasn't a lot of advertising, there was no internet, there was no television, there was only waves, you talked to somebody and they tried to influence you. So in the sales era, it was really about just getting people to decide. You didn't really care if they ever came back, you just wanted to sell. And when you hear sales today and sales people, some of you still have a negative connotation about that. You do. And you shouldn't. Because we don't want to be those people. We don't even want to deal with those people. When I work with startup companies and they have this negative predisposition to sales, I say, stop that. Because we're not going to be those people. We're going to be the companies that people want to do business with. We're going to be the repeat sale, the referral sale. We're going to be the ones that they aspire to do business to. We want to be their brand. We want to be this great experience. It's not going to be anything like what you think. And if I can get them to get rid of that, their predisposition is correct to be a good marketer. Pushback happens when you start having people being sold to. They go, stop it. And all of a sudden, we evolved a business model that said marketing is actually better. Let's allow people to make choices. So the marketing era came along, and companies realized all we've got to do is communicate better. We need to put information out there. We need to give people choices to differentiate. So co companies started to evolve their products. That car there does exactly the same with that black Henry Ford Model T did in 1910. It gets you from point A to B. But why does it look like that? Why does it have air conditioning, a stereo, and comfortable leather seats, and all these things? Why does it have all that stuff now? Why? It's a better experience because who wanted it? Customers. The customers started being listened to. And the evolution of that car is based on what customers wanted. In other words, customers said, well, if you want us to buy your cars, you better have these things in it. And you see cars trying to one-up each other now, just like smartphones trying to one-up each other. And that's all about marketing. So what happens is, is the focus has shifted away from the production people over to the customer. And customers are now saying, 
what's the best value you can give me? Because I got choice. I got power here. So in this value-based era, the focus is absolutely on the customer. This is why marketers become critical. This whole idea of differentiating you from all those other people out there supplying it, this is a, the biggest part of business today. You absolutely need a good product and good supply chain and good support. But if you don't market it well, it won't sell. The best product does not always win. There used to be a saying, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. That saying happened before marketing was relevant, right? In other words, if you build something good, people will want to buy it. No, today if you build something good, you better tell everybody over and over and over and over, otherwise they're not going to get it. An inferior product that's marketed better will sell. And that's what happens. A lot of co I, f I see companies losing. They lose, not because they're a, a, a bad product, because they're bad marketers. And it's massive to, to bridge that gulf. A lot of startup companies I work with, and Kevin Shore over there knows this, we call them product-centric. You know what product-centric is? What's product-centric mean? Yeah. What's that? Exactly. And marketing is about the customer, right? So I'm trying to get them to, to bridge that huge gulf to, from the product to the customer. And my role as mentor is to pull those together as soon as possible. And we do that. Some companies take longer than others. But the ones who get it right away, it's quite amazing how they start changing their view of what they're doing. We're doing this for them. We need to figure out what value we bring. So this marketing era that we're in now is now, is, is now evolving to the point that we're into what we call the value-based marketing era, that we really got to truly understand what value we bring. Otherwise, we've got no story to tell. People don't care how your product works. They want to know what it does, right? And I'll show you in a minute some ways to, to, to do this. But in this particular era, one of the worst businesses to be in is a smartphone business because it's literally, what have you done for me today? What a tough business to be in. How much more can you possibly get on your smartphone? Just wait and see. This thing is going to be doing so much more than you even possibly imagine now. You know, people are talking about payments and that. That's almost old hat. Where do you see what it does for you when you start getting personal marketing messages? You walk by a, bu a bulletin board or billboard or a an advertising sign and it talks to you because it's communicating with your smartphone about your buying preferences. Right? Near field communications. All this stuff is there now. It's going to evolve into such a powerful set of marketing tools that you people in this class will accept it as normal in the future. It'll be quite shocking to older generations. That billboard just talked to me. <laughs> you guys will be walking along. Why didn't that billboard talk to me? You know what I mean? It's just, this is the evolution of marketing, right? So, so when you understand here that if you look at the smartphone business, I said, I think BlackBerry is the best device that was ever made. The problem was is they didn't have enough marketing, enough apps, enough things to get people excited. And iPhone came along and had more apps. I did a, by the way, I did a survey of my class. I don't know if you guys were in the class when I did this. People complained that BlackBerry did not have enough apps because iPhone said, we got like a million apps. That's marketing, by the way. I said, how many apps do you guys actually use? Remember this? And everybody figured out it was kind of mm, 10 to 20. And they said, at, at this point in time, I think BlackBerry had, I don't know, 300,000 apps available. And they're going, look at what a joke. They only got 300,000 apps. I said, how many do you actually use again? 10 to 20. But iPhone's got a million. Therefore, it's better. You see, that's really weird. <laughs> so what we have to understand is that, that a company like BlackBerry had to differentiate itself, not on the number of apps, which turned out to be really important to a lot of people, but in the business market, secure communications. And those, that differentiation is their life Blood to, or their lifeline to stay in, in, in business. So we need to know what targeted value we bring to what customers. We, don't, we can't be all things to all people. And one of the best lessons you'll ever learn is target marketing. I mean, there's not many companies that can be all things to all people, right? Particularly with finite resources. So in value-based marketing, we have to make sure we drive the right value to the right target customers. And everything is about value. And this definition, again, is a good one, a bit academic, but the fundamental purpose of marketing is to create value for both the firm and the customer. So it's a two-way relationship. Value is, in essence, what you get for what you give up. 
And companies have also realized that the price of a product is not the most important thing. The experience with the product, how difficult it is to get the product, the support the product provides. That's the total thing that people consider when they buy something. So marketing has to wrap itself around all of that and say we have to make sure that whole experience works. So it's not just about putting an ad out there. That's a little tiny component of marketing. It's about the whole value package and the whole consumer experience. And again, there's all kinds of people in this room who could contribute to that. Every one of you is smart enough to know what can work in a consumer's hands. What type of technology would enhance that? What type of, uh, of support is needed? So all of that's there, and a lot of companies don't have it. So they look to people like you to say, can you help us as a company drive the right value into the right consumer's hands? How can you help us? Right? And that's what marketing is all about, driving that value in. How are we doing for time? Pretty good. If you want to be a good marketer, you're going to understand all of this. Value propositions. Anyone ever wrote a value proposition? Yeah? It's a core, a core fundamental thing. If you can't say in one sentence exactly what you do, who you do it for, and why they should keep talking to you, then you don't know what a value proposition is. And too many companies can't get to the point. They absolutely don't know what value and what proposition they're making to people. So you learn how to say very succinctly what you do. Some people use the term elevator pitch. I don't like that. But it is somewhat descriptive of what it is. And you know what an elevator pitch means, by the way? It's what you can say between it, when an elevator, you get on in an elevator, it goes down a few floors, that amount of time. That's really what it means. But a value proposition is even more powerful. It's the first sentence you say. It's the first line in your email. It's the first line you might see on your website. It's one of those front-end things that gets people to go, oh, that's really cool. Because if you do this really well, the three most powerful words in business, if you're a marketer, you know what they are? Tell me more. It's brilliant. Tell me more. And if you sent an email, someone thinks, tell me more. If you said something, they said, tell me more. They look at your website and they said, tell me more. Your marketing is working. So our job is to make sure that we, we cover the basis as to why would they say, tell me more. Well, you have to use things like W-I-I-F-M. Anyone know what that stands for? Don't you guys in my class say it? Critical for your marketer. W-I-I-F-M. This is the radio station that all customers listen to. What's in it for me? Too many people write marketing based on what's in it for them as a company or the product. That's irrelevant to the customer. The customer, what's in it for me? Right? So what's in it for them is often things like your USP, which stands for? Unique selling point. Why are you different? Because they're going to look at that competitive landscape and right away want to know, hey, if you're new and you're not well branded like them, why are you different? And you can raise the relevance of your brand immediately by having a point of differentiation, which is exactly what they were looking for. So you may have some established brands in that place, but you move up on that landscape, and now you're on, equal, on, on a level playing field just because of that. But if you didn't tell them and you didn't communicate it, they're not going to get it. These words here, value, results, ROI, those three things, we drive this home constantly in marketing messaging. That's the WIIFM stuff, along with the USP. What's in it for these people? What results am I going to get? When you get into B2B world, which stands for? This one here becomes critical. Which stands for? Exactly. I sit with my clients who are trying to sell in the business, in the business to business environment. And they're marketing away and they're saying very nice, kind of grandiose, wonderful things. I said, you've got to understand something about this enterprise sale you're in here. They're not going to buy it until they can figure out when the return's going to come on the investment. And I said, and so if you can't calculate that for them, they may not take the time to figure it out themselves. So you may have to create some test case scenarios, some betas, some pilot projects that give you the data points that allow you to put in place some empirical evidence that says if you buy our solution, Within six months, you'll have paid it back because your sales are likely to increase by this, your expenses are likely to increase by, uh, decrease by that. That's the type of marketing you have to do for that target market, right? So we start talking about <coughs> quantifiable things here at a, at a B2C level, which is, as a consumer, it's much more subjective. It's more about touchy-feely and all that stuff. So again, when you think about your target markets, you have to market correctly. What is it they need to hear in order, order for them to say those three beautiful words, which are? 
Everybody together? That's it. That's it. That's like a hallelujah moment. You get a little business that gets people saying, tell me more. Like, wow, now we got their attention. That's a pretty amazing thing, just getting their attention in a landscape filled with competitive offerings. One of the most important things you can do is often to uh, talk about a problem or a pain they have or an opportunity or gain they're trying to make. That's by, up to WIIFM. If you're solving that problem or that pain, or you're helping to achieve an opportunity or gain, you're going to get their attention. They're going to say, tell me more. You fix that problem, how do you do that? Like, that's what we want to do. That's what marketing is all about. And most important in all marketing is to have a call to action. If you understand marketing is that at the moment most marketing hits a person, they're typically not ready to buy. It's a progressive decision. Sometimes it takes a long time. In the B2B world, we may market and then eventually sell to a company over a period of six months before they finally decide. A consumer might buy in 60 seconds or in six minutes, or in 60, you know? We have to understand how long it takes. So we always have a, have a call to action which allows progression, right? Little incremental steps. We had the ADA model we talked about. You remember what ADA was? It's like a test here now. <laughs> See, in the advertising world, they have this thing called ADA, which is how they advertise. Attention, interest, desire, action. So they say, if you're a brand new product, your first advertisements are just to get their attention. These are not action advertised. We're not saying, buy this today. They're going to go, what exactly is it? Who are you? So your advertisements are constructed just to get their attention, then to get them to interest, then to desire, then to action. There's a progression. There are calls to action along the way. The first ad might just say, hey, check out our website. Call to action. Very simple. Download our white paper. Watch our two-minute video, right? Little things. These calls to action are progressive, and they educate. So the attention interest parts always increase to the point where a person finally says, you know what, I really want that. Then you give them some incentive, and the action happens. Now they buy, right? And that's what marketing is about. Understanding your target market, progressing them along a spectrum of education to a point of action that they will now happily decide. There's no pressure, there's no BS, there's no sales involved here. When marketing works well, people will sell themselves. What you're really trying to do is help them buy. That's all. That's all we're trying to do. Now, let's say you figure out the right words, and you really want to get your message home to people so that it sticks in their head. There's a couple of ways. If you just take a minute, you can write these down. And this is what marketers have come up with. They have basically said, we need to get our message into the heads of our customers. And they have come up with so many incredibly creative ways to get that message into the heads of their customers that this becomes almost too much. But surprisingly, nobody will use all of it. In here, there's a selection of ways to get your message across. And one of the companies that I work with, I say, let's start with 10 to 20. 10 to 20 different ways, different types of media, you know, different forms of communicating, different ways to re reinforce the message. And we build out a, a kind of a core marketing strategy with a set of tactics. Eventually, we may evolve to more tactics. More tactics often take more money, but if we're successful with our first tactics, we're getting sales, which means we have revenue, which means we can now spend. We can grow the business, right? So again, I'm not going to say write these down, but uh, if you guys wanted a copy of this, I can get you a copy. I want to tell you a quick story, how important it is to, to, to get marketing into the heads of your customers, to create that predisposition. And the folks in my class probably heard this story, but it's the best advertisement I have ever seen. And it was by a company called Saatchi & Saatchi. Anyone know what they do? Advertising, right? So they're in the business of advertising. A lot of companies out there are not very good at telling the story about their own companies, right? They got products, they got services, but when it comes to talking about it, they kind of stumble along. So they go out to an advertising agency, goes, can you guys tell the story for us? And these advertising agencies will compete. They will actually pitch them. Three agencies will come in, a bunch of pitches, and they'll go, wow, we select your pitch. So Satch and Satch, you might get the business, $10 million ad budget, away they go, they sell a bunch of product. Well, Satch and Satch had an advertisement and it was on TV, and I remember seeing it, and when it came on the TV, I didn't know who it was for, because it was a, a lady sitting in a doctor's office. 
That's all it was. There's no sound, there's no words, no picture, there's nothing. Just sitting in the doctor's office. Then a doctor walks into the room and he stands there beside her. I have no idea what this is for, but it's, it's kind of got my attention because I'm thinking, you know, is it about a doctor's service? Like, eh? Doctor walks out of the picture, he comes walking back in. Now he's got a drill in his hand. I'm thinking, oh, maybe Black & Decker. I don't know. <laughs> By the way, the fact that I know Black & Decker is not accidental, right? Black & Decker put that in my head. So he takes a drill. Now he's really got my attention because he walks up to her, puts the drill in the middle of her forehead and starts drilling a hole in her head. Now it's really got my attention, right? He pulls the drill out, and this beam of light hits him right in the face. He jumps back, and on the wall right behind him is a series of advertisements. And she goes to him, Doctor, what is it? He goes, Advertising. <laughs> and then on the bottom it just says, Sachi and Sachi. And I went, Oh my God, OMG. <laughs> that is one of the most brilliant ads I have ever seen. Because when you want to talk about predisposition and how do brands get in people's heads, it's through powerful, repetitious advertising. And so what was Saatchi and Saatchi saying? What were they saying? Yeah. We're gonna, yeah. You use us, your products will be in the heads of your customers. Wow. I was like, I, I praised that one. I was like, hallelujah. That is, that's amazing. So you know, we have to be that good and that creative because we have to stand out from the crowd. So, you know, you could actually work for an advertising agency someday. You could be one of those creative people coming up with these crazy campaigns. You know, you could work for a company and come up with your own campaigns. But the reason that they turned off into these advertising agencies is because we don't do it very well ourselves. So, this stuff becomes important as long as the message being delivered through it is creative and memorable, done in enough forms of media that it stays. If you want to do this stuff, there's lots of jobs. I just put a list here of some, some of the ones. These types of jobs you will find are, in, in varying degrees, just different ways of doing the same thing, right? Supporting the marketing mission of that company. Whether it's junior or senior, whether you're strategic or tactical, whether you're assisting, supporting, or leading, it doesn't matter. What it means is that you're on a team, you're in a group, you're in a division or a department that's focused and dedicated on making that company win, right? I cannot underestimate how important the marketing department is in a company. Remember, the best products do not win. The best marketing wins. So if you've got the best product, you damn well better market well, because it would be a shame if your best product does not win. So our job and our responsibility in most companies is to make sure we got the best, the brightest, the most creative, the most focused people involved in this thing so that we can get our message across. We are creative enough so that it does stick in the head. And we don't give a damn if we're a startup. We are going to try to put our brand in the heads of our customers and our target customers, not on the globe yet, in our target, cu target customers so that it sticks. And so that the day they need what they've got, who are they going to think of? Us. And it wasn't accidental, right? It wasn't accidental. It was a mission. We were purposely putting that there, and we were reinforcing it. So any number of these roles are open to you guys. All those tactics are available. Any number of those tactics can be implemented by you guys. You guys can come up with the marketing messages that we drive through this. Marketing is not that complicated. It is, though, a mission. <laughs> and it's not a random, not an ad hoc thing. If you're going to get dedicated to it, get good at it. Right? Understand it. Become part of it. There's all kinds of organizations. The CDMA, Canadian Direct Marketing Association, the CMA, Canadian Marketing Association, the AMA, the American Marketing Association. Get on their mailing list. Have them send you stuff. There's a lot of companies out there in the marketing business. Get on their mailing list. HubSpot. HubSpot, Marketo. These are amazing. Uh, these are actually marketing tools, marketing automation tools. But if you're on HubSpot's or Marketo's mailing list, they're going to try to sell you stuff. Don't worry about it. They put on free 30-minute and 60-minute webinars constantly about really cool marketing things, marketing automation, how to do good email campaigns, how to use social media to leverage your brand. Like This stuff is amazing stuff. So you as a marketer can do nothing but learn from this stuff and see how they market. Right. So you absorb a ton of content. You see their methodology. So AMA, CMA, HubSpot, Marketo, I, re I recommend them all to you. So, there's a lot you can do. There's a lot of really cool things in marketing. I, I, the funnest part of business 
absolutely the funnest part of business is marketing. Coming up with really cool things to do to get the attention of all those customers out there who are inundated with a lot of noise. Noise is a marketing term. You know what noise is? Noise is, means competing marketing messages. So how do you rise above the noise, right? You do something so different. One of the best marketers in the world is a guy named Richard Branson. He's got a brand called Virgin. He keeps coming up with marketing stuff that just blows me away. You know? So you'll study guys like Richard Branson and see what they do. And you'll find that you could actually have a fun career. Some people love to do development. They want to get in a dark room, put their head down, and work away for hours coding. It's fantastic. I'd rather be marketing, having fun being out there with the customers.